Santi Ponce, a town in the province of Seville, sits atop the remains of the Roman city of Italica. This was the first stable Roman settlement in what was then known as Hispania, and was therefore also the first such settlement in Baetis, the Roman province to which it belonged. Italica was the precursor of those territories which would best and most thoroughly adopt the empire's culture, and today it is an excellent base from which to discover Andalusia's Roman heritage. Nine kilometers from Hispalis, Roman Seville, is therefore the natural point of departure for the Ruta Betica Romana, Roman Baetis route. Hispalis was the capital of its conventus, one of the four administrative districts in which to Baetis was divided, partly as a result of the fact that ships of a deep draft could reach the city's inland port. To facilitate the distribution of goods, several roads radiated from his palace. These included the Via Gusta and that which today is known as the Via de la Plata, literally the Silver Route. The Via de la Plata connects Seville to Asturias via Merida or Emerita Agusta, its strategic objective being to enable the export of minerals. The Via de la Plata passed close to Italica and it is also thought that Italica had a second Roman road leading to Ituki, now known as Tejada, whose aqueducts supplied the population of Italica with water. As well as being a service road for maintaining the aqueduct, it also connected the city with the mining district in what is today the province of Huelva. The two miliari or milestones found in the area might well have come from these two roads. Such milestones inform the traveller of the distance from a road's point of origin or the distance to the next stop. The first of these two milestones was found in a house in Santi Ponce in 1942, far away from its original emplacement. In 1990 the second was found in situ during the excavations undertaken in the area around the theatre in Italica. Both stones bear the inscription Hadrianus Avge Fesit, Hadrian Augustus made me. Escipion, when pursuing the Carthaginian army to the south of the Iberian Peninsula, bumped into the surrounding areas of the current Alcalá del Rio, then called Ilipa Magna. Almost all the authors agree that this was the area where the famous battle of Ilipa took place. The armies fought there and thanks to the strategic skill of Escipión and its orderly and numerous army, they crushed the Carthaginian army that finally escaped to the south of the Iberian Peninsula. Escipión looked for a perfect strategic location, housed by the Turdetan population and kept part of his army to keep an eye on their rear guard. He continued to the south pursuing the Carthaginians, but the Roman population stayed here and gave rise to what we all know as the archaeological site of Italica. Pero aquí, en este sitio, que después se llamó Itálica, se quedó una población de origen romano que dio lugar a, a lo que todos conocemos hoy como, como el yacimiento arqueológico de Itálica. We believe that new Roman settlers arrived here during the Republic and the social ascent of families from Italica was rapid. There is proof that there were illustrious Italicans from the mid-2nd century BC onwards. In the early 1st century BC, Italica was granted municipal status and when Italica-born Hadrian was emperor, the city became a colony, its name changing to Colonia Aelia Augusta Italicensium. The Latin writer Aulus Gellius, a contemporary of Augustus, wrote in his work Nocti Attici. Hadrian was surprised that the people of Italica, as well as other former colonies, among which he mentioned Utica, instead of continuing to live according to their own laws and customs, should ask to be made into colonies.
Italica reached the peak of its splendor in the first century AD, thanks to an event that until then had been unheard of. A citizen born in a Roman province and not in Rome itself became emperor. This emperor was Trajan, born in Italica in 53 AD. The great wealth enjoyed by families in Baetis in general, and Italica in particular, meant that citizens played an increasingly important role in politics. This process of opening up imperial politics began under Nero and culminated when Trajan, adopted son of the Emperor Nerva, became emperor in 98 AD after a brilliant military career. Trajan was a great strategist, and thanks to military victories on fronts that had up to that time been unstable, he extended the empire's frontiers to their greatest historical limits. On his deathbed and in order to ensure the succession, Trajan adopted Hadrian, one of his relatives, Hadrian, whose father was from Italica and whose mother, from what is now Cadiz, was famous for his intellectual training and his enthusiasm for the Hellenistic culture. Before being proclaimed emperor in 117 AD, he had already been governor of Syria. Hadrian spent his rule traveling throughout the empire as he attempted to both reform it and to maintain its borders. Shortly before his death, in 138 AD, he composed the poem Below, a work that reflects his artistic talent. Animula bagula blandula, hospes comesque corporis, O vagabond and affectionate soul, my body's guest and companion, where now will you live? In severe places, dark and livid, and no more will you enliven me as once you did. During the period of the Italica-born emperors, the city's universal fame grew. It also enjoyed improvements to its infrastructure and received imperial endowments. Indeed, during Hadrian's reign, the city was extended and from then on Italico was described in terms of the Vetus Urbs, or original city and the Nova Urbs, or the streets that were built when the city expanded under the imperial Aegis. Italica was protected by a wall that enclosed its Gridaran street system, and the Cardus and Decumanus Maximus crossed in the Forum, today the heart of the city of Santi Ponce. Life there was typical of life in any prosperous Roman city. The inhabitants would go on an almost daily basis to the Thermi, or thermal bars. In Italica there were two, the Thermi Minori, or smaller bars built by Trajan, and the Thermi Maiori, the larger bars constructed by his successor Hadrian and it was there that the citizens would relax and socialize. Both the colossal amphitheatre, with a capacity of 25,000 people, and the city's theatre are proof of the scale of public works in Italica. Despite the fact that most of its ornamental facing has been looted over the centuries, Italica's amphitheatre is one of the best conserved in Roman Hispania. Gladiatorial combats and the casting of criminals to wild beasts were enormously popular events, and the city would become a ghost city while thousands of people vociferously watched the spectacle.
A rich family's domus covered a large area, and unlike the insuli, where the more modest classes lived, it was a single-story complex whose different parts and functions were well defined. Its ground plan, with some exceptions, was standard throughout the whole empire. When Hadrian extended the city, its census increased to 10,000 inhabitants, and although, when compared with other cities in Baetis, this is not a particularly large number, the political importance of the families that lived there was not to be underestimated. During the 2nd century AD, magnificent new domai sprang up towards the northeast of the original city. One such house is known today as the Domus de los Pajaros, or the House of the Birds. This house, which today we would describe as a luxury residence, was on the Cardus Maximus and occupies half of the eastern side of its block, with an area of almost 1,700 square meters. On either side of its main facade, there is a taberna, which would sell local produce or act as a small workshop. From the ostium or entrance, visitors proceeded to the vestibule and thence to the peristylium, a colonnaded gallery that gave light and air to the rooms revolving around it. Beneath the main garden there was a cistern to collect rainwater. The cubicula, the family's private rooms and bedrooms, gave onto the courtyard. Following the complex central axis, visitors would then arrive at the triclinium. This house's living room would perhaps have had openings in the side walls, so that its occupants could look out onto the courtyards on either side. On the floors there would be decorative mosaics. This house's most characteristic mosaic, depicting birds, has given it the name we know it by today. One of the cubicula would have been used by the pater familias, or head of the household, to carry out business. The Musivaria mosaic decoration in the southern part of the house is also of great beauty. The decline of the empire was mirrored by Italica's own decline. The Visigoths, but more importantly the Moors, slowly abandoned the Roman city. In 1301, and now under Christian rule, construction of the monastery of San Isidoro del Campo was completed. Later, the Hieronymite monks helped the locals to found the new town of Santiponce upon the ruins of Italica. The original Christian settlement, located on the banks of the Guadalquivir, on Isla de Hierro, was abandoned in 1603 as frequent flooding forced the inhabitants to seek higher ground. The memory of Italica faded until the 16th century, when people began to become aware of the value of their Roman legacy. In the early 17th century, the civilian poet and archaeologist Rodrigo Caro wrote, O oh, woe, Fabius, now only you see, abandoned fields, a musty hill, where once rose famed Italica, Cyprius Africanus colony, now throw down those fearsome walls, they are pitiful relics, nothing more. Yace el temido honor de la espantosa muralla y lastimosa reliquia es solamente. Today the town of Santiponce is aware of the importance of Roman culture, yet it can also boast of other historical treasures. Such is the case of the Monastery of San Isidoro del Campo, founded in the early 14th century by Guzmán el Bueno. Initially it was created to house Cistercian monks, but they were expelled and Hieronymites took their place. In the 19th century it was abandoned and, except for short periods of occupation, remains so to the present day. San Isidoro del Campo comprises a church, three courtyards, a refectory, a chapter house, cells and workshops. Although the church appears to have just a single aisle, it is in fact two adjacent churches. 
The explanation is that in his will, Guzman el Bueno forbade that any of his descendants be buried alongside himself and his wife. His son, therefore, ordered an adjoining church to be built for his own burial. The building is in the Gothic Mudejar style and presents a stern, fortress-like aspect. Con el aspecto de una fortaleza militar. Cada uno de los Each of the two churches has extremely valuable works of art, among which pride of place must surely go to the altarpiece in Guzmán o Buenos Chapel, work of Baroque sculpture Juan Martínez Montañez. A visit to the two-story Fernando Marmolejo Municipal Museum is a must. Santiponce also offers visitors its 47-hectare Alamillo Park. Located in the northern part of the borough, nature lovers can enjoy a day out, practice in sports or participating in cultural or ecological events. The Via Verde de Italica, a route following a disused railway line and passing through the area's countryside, is a new initiative enabling its users to get to know the historical heritage of Seville's Al Girafe district. The main idea of the Santipons Town Hall has always been to integrate the rich monumental heritage of the town with the cultural aspects. What better idea than carrying out the cultural events in the monumental areas? For example, where we are right now, the Italica Theatre. In April we have the Italica Greco Latin Drama Festival dedicated to students. It is a fantastic venue where the theatre is used again for the same purpose for which it was built in the first century. On the other hand, in the Italica archaeological site, in this case in the Roman amphitheatre, a magnificent amphitheatre which held 25,000 spectators every year on the second Saturday of Easter. We have the Al Giraffe Via Crucis, a fantastic venue for which it was recently declared festival of tourist interest by the Junta de Andalucía. In addition, in the Italica area, we also have the Italica cross-country race. In this case, a sports event also considered as one of the most important internationally. And finally, I would not like to finish without mentioning the old and classical music cycle held at the San Isidoro del Campo Monastery, a 14th century jewel which has been in the process of restoration for many years, but fortunately has been open for the past few years for the public to visit. The old and classical music cycle takes place in October in one of the two churches of the monastery. This is the essential culture of Santi Ponce. Santi Ponce's delicious gastronomy is based on natural produce from the surrounding farmland. Vegetables, greens and pulses, fruit and of course olive oil. Such products are the basis for simple varied dishes like tripe, meat casseroles and stews, salads and light vegetable stews. One dish that must never be absent from any self-respecting table is rice with game, such as rabbit, throstles and partridge. The short distance separating Santi Ponce from Seville means that this small town is close to the excellent transport links that connect Seville with the rest of Spain and the world beyond. Links such as the high-speed train, an international airport and the N4, AP7 roads and the A92 dual carriageway give visitors a wide choice of ways of getting to Seville and once in the city, Santi Ponce is a mere 10 minutes away by road.
Santiponce has been able to keep itself separate from Seville's rapid expansion and therefore it still maintains its rural feel. Visitors can enjoy this air of tranquility as they stroll through Santiponce streets or as they make their way to Italica. Once Rome's first stable settlement in Hispania, Italica is now the starting point for the Roman Bietis route, a route that will reveal to visitors Rome's influence on Andalusia.